Hey everybody, today we talk about vertical circles, so things like roller coaster loops or people going over hills or, you know, the, the yo-yo trick where you spin it around your body. It's going to be great. Let's start with talking about the, uh, the yo-yo trick. It's called the Around the World. If you've never seen it, here's a professional yo-yo guy with a mic attached to his shirt. Yeah, this trick, you don't actually have to just stop at one Around the World. You can do as many as you can, as wow. long as the yo-yo is still spinning. So, this trick isn't... Okay, not hard. Great. So... The around the world is an example of a vertical circle where if we wanted to analyze what was happening, we would look at tension in the rope. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to draw a ball attached to a string and make it go in a vertical circle. And then we're going to draw this ball at four locations. Okay, right there, at the top, and at the sides. Now, each of these locations are going to have a weight force that is down. Mg, 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 and Mg. But only in certain locations will the force of the weight be a centripetal force, or a force that either points towards the center or away um, from the center. So that would be here and here. So at those two locations, you have forces that are centripetally oriented. But on the sides, these forces are tangentially oriented. So tension at every time is going to point towards the center. Um, at the bottom, the tension needs to be big enough so that it's larger than the weight and results in a net upwards centripetal force. On the sides, this tension would point in. And this would be the complete centripetal force. Uh, and they would both be equal there. And at the top, you might have some tension, but since the weight is actually pointing directly down towards the center of the circle, you actually don't need any tension um, to pull down. If you did have some tension, it would be a little bit, and you would draw it like that. Okay, so let's write equations for the centripetal force that you would be getting at each of these locations. On the sides, it's pretty easy. Tension is your centripetal force. There's no angle, so you would just write T equals mv squared over r. Same thing over here, t equals mv squared over r. But at the top and the bottom, you have a tension and a weight that are sometimes in the same direction and sometimes in opposite directions. So at the bottom, you would make t positive and mg negative because it points away from the center. And this would equal mv squared over r. At the top, you would have tension and the weight both pointing towards the center, so they're both positive. So your equation for centripetal force would be T plus mg equals mv squared over r. Okay, so we have these four equations. The tension is the only centripetal force um, on the sides. Here we're going to have uh, tension either being added to the weight or the weight being subtracted from the tension depending on what part of the circle you're on. So let's do an example. This helps if you see an example. Okay, you swing a 0.5 kilogram baseball tied to a string in a vertical circle that has a one meter radius. How fast do you need to swing the ball so that there is no tension in the string at the top of its arc? Okay, so here, if you draw the circular path, wow, what a circle. You're great at drawing circles. All the centers off. So you draw your tension up. In this particular problem, the weight is the only downward force at the top of the path. So there's no tension. So what that tells us is that here, mg is our centripetal force, and all we have to do is write mv squared, sorry, mv squared over r. And the mass of the ball is irrelevant because it gets canceled out, and we get g equals v squared over r. And to solve for the velocity, we're just going to say the v, uh, velocity is the square root of g times r, or the square root of ger. In fact, every time you see a circular motion problem, you've probably noticed that root g times r is really like everywhere. If you have a banked curve, then it's going to be root g r times tan theta. Um, if it's a vertical circle, you're going to have root g r. This, is, this appears again, again, again. So every time you see a uni uh, uniform circular motion like this, you can think to yourself, oh, grr, I don't want to do this. And you've got the equation. All right, so here we do the square root of 10 meters per second squared uh, times the radius of 1 meter which is going to give you 3.16 meters per second. Okay, so that's your tangential or your linear velocity. Sometimes we call this the critical speed. We'll see that when roller coaster loops happen. So the critical speed is the speed that you need to uh, be spinning so that at the top of your path there is no 
tension or normal force or anything pulling you down. Just your weight acts as a centripetal force. Okay, so that's key. All right, now let's talk about vertical circles where normal force is involved. So here I have a picture of a stuntman, uh, Rod Kimball, going through a loop on his moped. Now, just like tension, you are going to have four different points where, depending on where you're at, you'll have a different force responsible for the centripetal force. Let's first draw the weights. Okay, you've got the weight, mg down, mg down. I'm going to try and stick to the center, mg down. And then here, mg down. Okay, so just like before, um, you're going to have forces that point towards the center, no matter where you're at. These are your centripetal forces. And if you can't really tell from the drawing, there's no rope that's causing you to be in a, a go on, move in a circle. Um, but if you were on the track, what you would feel is an upward push from the track. Like down here at the bottom, you would experience an upward push from the track. And if you were here on the side, you would experience a leftward push from the track. If you were on the other side, you would experience a rightward push. And at the top, if you're going too fast, you would experience a little bit of a downward push. Now, because these pushes are always um, perpendicular to the circle or the loop, we just call these normal forces. Okay, so this is a normal force. So the difference between a ball and a string and a vertical loop where you're on like a roller coaster or a stunt like this is that no, the normal force, the support from the surface, is what's responsible for your centripetal force. Okay, so on the sides, your normal force is your centripetal force, and you can set them equal to mv squared over r. At the top and the bottom, you have to consider the normal force and the weight and whether they're in the same direction. So at the bottom, you'll have the normal force minus mg equals mv squared over r. At the top, you'll have the normal force plus mg equals mv squared over r. Now, it is possible for you to have no normal force at the top. What that, would, what that would feel like is a bit of weightlessness at the top of the loop. So you don't feel any pressure. Like imagine you're on a roller coaster. You wouldn't feel any pressure from the ground or from the seat at that point. You would feel like nothing is pushing you. And so we sometimes call that weightless, much like the problem that we just did with the string. So let's see what this looks like for a roller coaster problem. You have a roller coaster cart with two people in it, um, and you are approaching a vertical loop. The cart has a mass of 800 kilograms, while the first person has a mass of oh, 60 kilograms. The second person has a mass of 75 kilograms. Okay, this is important. What is the minimum speed? Okay, so this is going to be, again, that thing that we call the critical speed. Okay, the minimum speed needed to uh, for the cart to complete the loop if the radius is 14.4 meters. Okay, so here... The best of your abilities, draw a little roller coaster, roller coaster loop. And what we're talking about here is you go into the roller coaster loop. Here you are, you're having a great time, you're with your friend EA. You're going to go through the loop, and basically at the top, for just a moment, you are going to experience weightlessness, or there's no pressure from the track pushing down on you. If you go any slower than this speed, then you would start to fall down, crash and fall down. But if you're going fast enough at this point, just barely fast enough, then you'll continue to go into the loop and it will push against you so that you can get that normal force to change the direction of your velocity. But the key is when it says minimum speed, when it's talking about this critical speed, you are supposed to assume that at the top, the centripetal force is only your weight. There's no normal force. Okay, so what that means is I can say at the top, mg is the centripetal force, set it equal to mv squared over r, get rid of m, and we'll find that the velocity again is the square root of g times r, or it's root ger, which for us is 10 meters per second squared, times the radius, which is 14.4 meters. Okay, or the root of 144, which is 12. Good job. Okay, great. So that's the minimum speed that you have to enter the loop so that you don't um, fall down to your death in the middle of it. All right, now, we're going to do this same exact sa the same problem, except now we're going to ask what uh, is happening to the 60-kilogram person. So if the 60-kilogram person experiences weightlessness, so that means our velocity, it's the same numbers, our velocity is 12 meters per second, we're traveling at the critical speed, 
what will the normal force be at the sides and the bottom of the loop? Okay, so what will the normal force be at the sides and bottom of the loop? So if we draw our loop and we remember, you know, the forces that we have at each of these spots, okay, we know that at the top, the only centripetal force is the weight, mg. So we can go ahead and find the weight, mg, at the top if we want. We know that it is uh, of the 60 kilogram person, it's going to be 600 newtons each time. And what we know is that at the sides, you have a normal force that points in, and the normal force at these points are equal to the centripetal force. And at the bottom, the normal force minus the weight is equal to the centripetal force. So let's figure out what the normal force is uh, at the sides first. You know that the mass is 60 kilograms. You know the velocity is 12 meters per second, the whole thing squared. You divide that by the radius of, sorry, that should still be in there. The radius is 14.4 meters. So you divide by the radius of 14.4 meters, and you are going to get 600 newtons. Wow, isn't that interesting? Now, that will also be the normal force over here. But at the bottom, when you would find the normal force, you actually have to add the weight to mv squared over r. So the normal force is going to be mv squared over r plus mg. Well, we already found mv squared over r. It's 600 newtons. So we get 600 newtons plus, and we already found the weight, 600 newtons. So in this particular case, the normal force is 1,200 newtons, or twice the weight. So that means that as you are entering this loop, you will feel twice as heavy at the bottom than as you did at the top. Now, this is assuming uniform circular motion, uh, or you know UCM as we like to call it. Uh, and the thing about roller coasters loops that you've actually ridden is you actually don't experience a perfect circle in a loop. Sometimes you have two circles that intersect each other, and the like inner radius of this circle becomes what you travel. And this is its own shape, but we don't really need to worry about that because the AP test never puts them on. Uh, so the next problem, a motorcycle is traveling up on a one-sided hill, goes up on the hill and down the other. So for this, it's kind of hard to visualize, but imagine there's like a circle underneath of a hill that you're trying to go over. And you know that the radius of this circle is something that you would like to find. That's what's going to ask you to find. If you want to find the maximum speed the cyclist can go over the hill without losing contact with the road, then what that means is that at the top of the hill, right, you start here. You're having a great time. Yeah, you're on a bicycle. Correct. You go up. And then right here, you're at the top of the road, and you're supposed to keep your contact. So here's what that means. You are going to have a centripetal force that is equal to your weight, meaning there's no normal force. If you were going less than this speed, there would be some normal force. If you were going more than this speed, then what would actually happen is you would lift off of the ramp and kind of like projectile motion over to the side. But so this problem is asking us to find um, the radius when our weight at the top of the hill is the centripetal force. So our weight is the centripetal force, which means we can set it equal to mv squared over r get rid of the mass, and to find that velocity, I'm sorry, to find the radius, we are going to swap g and r. So the radius equals v squared over g, or 18 meters per second, the whole thing squared, over 10 meters per second squared, which is going to give you 32.4 meters. Congratulations.